Hey guys, Tammy here. And this week we're going to talk about the nature of the narcissist. If you're watching me on YouTube, don't forget to hit that like button and also subscribe to the channel so that you get notified as new content is released. So I want to kind of come at this from the perspective of the narcissist versus the what I'll call the non-narcissist, right? As opposed to normal or some other word like that, which I always say I don't really like because I'm not sure there really is such a thing as normal. <laughs> After working with so many different people, I don't know that any of us would fall into that category. We're all very different. But of course, having some sort of personality disorder like this is a whole nother can of worms. And it does affect how we deal with other people in our lives. One of the things that narcissists are really do, and you know, it's funny because my first marriage, I was married to a narcissist. Um, as most of you know, my second husband, Thomas, passed away unexpectedly last year. We were together about 17 years and he was a non-narcissist, okay? And I always say, you know, that the one big difference that I think was kind of the core of everything in the difference of those marriages in a way was that Thomas was always willing to look at himself. He was always willing to try to figure out his part in things, to try to do it better, whatever, regardless of what I was doing, right? Regardless of if I, you know, was trying to do better, not trying to do better, whatever, his effort was not based on my effort. His effort was based on, you know, his own moral conviction that, you know, he had a duty to try to do things you know, better improve himself and grow and whatever. So one of the things that a narcissist really does is they deny mistakes and they do not do any introspection. So they don't try to own their part in it, right? They want to blame everybody else. And, you know, why does that happen? I think a lot of times because you know, narcissists have this image of themselves, this kind of grandiose view of themselves. They see themselves as better than ever others and all that kind of thing. And you have to have some humility about you in order to be able to have introspection and kind of examine your own shortcomings. You know, holding up that mirror, I always say, is really painful and really difficult. Um, and I know that, you know, our therapist that my first husband and I used to see uh, said that the one key thing that my ex-husband was missing was humility. You know, he just had zero humility. And so everything that happened in the marriage was, you know, my fault or, you know, the government's fault or his boss's fault or his, you know, whatever. It was always somebody else that wasn't him. Narcissists tend to value perfection. They are all about their image, right? And that's why people outside of your home are probably a lot of times like, oh, this person's so nice. They're so sweet. They're so this, they're those, so that. Because narcissists have this uncanny ability to meet someone, hone in exactly on what's important to that person or what they enjoy or whatever, and engage with them about that thing. And to create that connection very, very quickly. Um, but then, as we know, at home, behind closed doors, where nobody is seeing that outside image, that's when we see the true person and the way that they are. Uh, they tend to value status. They value winning, which is one of the things that comes into play when you're in court with them and you're dealing with this type of situation. This is why a narcissist can't see this from the perspective of the interest of the child, they're seeing it as the perspective of winning against you. You are the person to be beat. Um, the other thing that they really seek is, uh, that they really value is attention. And I say this a lot. I say the main currency for a narcissist is attention. And I think that is true once you're divorced or separated or no longer in a relationship with them. I think that that attention, even if it's negative, is the one thing that they generally still get from you because they're not getting sort of that admiration and things they got during the relationship. So the attention is the one currency that's still kind of flowing between the two of you. And that's why they behave poorly sometimes, because even if it's negative attention, they want to know that they have your attention. The other thing that they value is sort of that feeling of superiority, right? Like thinking that they're better than everybody else. Now let's look at as a non-narcissist what we value. 
a non-narcissist tends to value connection with the other person in, in the relationship, whether that's, whether that's a romantic relationship or friendships or family relationships or whatever, uh, non-narcissists will value connection. We value growth, right? So I want to improve as a person. I want to be better than I was the day before. I want to, uh, you know, uh, leave the world a better place than I found it. You know, all those types of, of values, um, compassion, just compassion for other people and human beings and what they're going through and what they're struggling with. Authenticity. You know, I think this is a big reason that we have seen um, explosion of certain things in social media because when somebody comes across as genuinely authentic and, you know, I think people can sense that. And, you know, I've been told that a lot with, with what I do. Like, I think people can sense that, like, look, I've been through this. I've lived this. This is, I am a real person. I exist. I live in California. I'm here. I'm sticking to the planet. Like, I really have been through this and dealt with these issues. And so that connection that you feel as you're watching me on video or you're listening to the podcast or whatever, that's a connection with my authenticity, right? Because you can feel that. You can feel that I'm not just you know, making something up or that I've never experienced this or whatever. I think uh, people tell me frequently things I say, phrases I use, experiences I share, they know that I'm somebody that gets it, that understands what they're feeling. So that connection with authenticity. Um, I think we also value, you know, equality. I mean, I think, you know, things can't always be equal in life. I'm not saying that, but we are all just as worthy. You know, one person is as worthy as the next, regardless of your, you know, uh, regardless of your age, your sex, your gender, you know, your religious background, your, you know, whatever, all of those types of diversity things that we talk about, we are all worthy of that equality. And narcissists don't move through their world in that way. They don't see people as having the same value they see themselves as having more value than other people. And then other people are on a range of value depending on, honestly, what they can do for the narcissist. You know, if you're useful to me, then you have high value. If you're no longer useful to me, you no longer have value. And that's why these relationships tend to happen in this way, because at the beginning, you know, we're meeting a lot of their needs. We are in awe of them. We are doing things for them. You know, and so we're very, very useful to them in many, many ways, right? And then as the abuse happens through the relationship and you're not meeting those needs in the same way because your needs aren't getting met, suddenly you're not as useful. And that's a lot of times when we'll see either just the, the treatment and the abuse escalate to the point to where, you know, the person that is the non-narcissist says, I'm out, I can't do this anymore. Or frankly, a lot of times the narcissist will have affairs or do that type of thing to where, you know, uh, be, because they have just disregard for the other person at this point because the other person isn't serving their needs. So why is that important? I think because the more that you can behave in ways that alleviate the other person's fear, the more they calm down. So what do I mean by that? I always tell people when you're communicating with them, use language that isn't attacking. That isn't like, I'm trying to get you. I'm trying to document this. I'm trying to take the kids away. I'm trying to like, the more that you do that, the more that they are going to get worked up, the more that they are going to try to protect themselves. And they're going to see the need to attack you as the best mechanism for how to protect themselves. So honestly, trying to create some reassurance in them ironically, is one of the best ways to get them to calm down and stop attacking you. And this is really counterintuitive. But, and, and I'm not saying that you should like roll over and like let them do whatever they want to or, you know, just accept anything they say and all that kind of stuff. No, but this is why when we talk about simple things like the communication and then I say, keep a log and go document over everything over there. Don't document in your parenting app or in your email or your text. Go document it over here in the log because that evidence is just as valid if it's sitting in your log versus sitting in your email or your parenting app. And by putting it in your log and not putting it in your parenting app or your email, your ex isn't seeing it. 
And so it's not triggering them emotionally and putting them in a state of fear or anger or whatever, because when they are in that state, they're going to come back and start attacking you. The next thing that um, I think that narcissists do a lot is they kind of use these win-lose strategies, right? If, if you've heard seven habits of highly effective people, um, one of the things that uh, they talk about is trying to find win-win strategies, right? How do I create a situation that's going to help me, help you, help the child, help all of us? If we all get a little something out of it, it's a win-win for everybody, right? And unfortunately with narcissists, they see the game as win-lose. They see it as the more I get, the less you get, and I need to come out on top, you know? So you have to keep in mind when you're um, dealing with them that kind of giving them options, you know, say, you know, I could either do this or I could do that, kind of giving them options to choose from, that'll help them feel like they're in control and feel like, you know, they won, so to speak, when you can do that. So I have so many people that are trying to figure out, well, you know, why can't I just reason with them? Like many, many clients keep going back and keep responding and keep trying to use logic. Like if I just explain it in the right way, if I just use the right word, if I just say the right thing, right, then, then something's going to click in their little brain and they're going to get it. And the reason that they're not going to get it is because that click isn't going to happen because their value system is structured very differently than yours. You're thinking that click is going to happen because it's reasonable. It's good for the child. It's fair to both of you. It's, you know, it, it takes all these sort of um, morals and values into consideration, only that's not their morals and values, right? Their morals and values are their own superiority, their own attention, um, you know, their higher standards and all that kind of stuff, which is why your logic doesn't work. And what I frequently tell people is in order to play the game with a narcissist, you have, well, on their terms, in order to play, in order to beat a narcissist at their own game in the way that they play, in other words, if you're going back and forth tit for tat and you're thinking that you're going to beat them with logic, the only way you can do that is if you are willing to sink to their level of morality, okay? Unless you're willing to take on those values where you're valuing yourself, uh, putting yourself on a pedestal, having higher standards for yourself, not caring about other people, not being compassionate, not being authentic. If you're willing to strip yourself of your own values and put on their values, then okay, see if you can beat them at their game, go at it. But I think for 99.999% of us, we aren't willing to do that, right? If you're willing to do that, you probably would have already done it. And probably a lot of the um, gap between you is the difference in these morals. The key to the, the main key to the whole thing, honestly, in one way is disengage. Don't try to beat them at their own game. You know, sidestep everything you can. You know, let them, you know, I remember that Thomas used to call this a judo move, right? You want to just kind of step out of the way and let their momentum carry them because usually they will be found out eventually. And so you just want to kind of play dumb, you know, do your documentation over in the other area. Don't call them out on things. Let them think they're getting their way. Let them think they're accomplishing what they want to accomplish. And the interesting thing about this is they usually will become more emboldened because they'll think, oh, this, and, and they have the, the narcissistic mindset to have this thought of like, oh, this person's so dumb. They don't even see what I'm doing. Like, they don't even know they're, they're like out to lunch. They can't even clue in, you know, my ex doesn't even know they're so clueless. They don't even realize half the things I do. It's not that you don't realize it. It's that you're over here documenting it in another spot. Right. And so they think you're clueless. And the more clueless and naive that they think you are, the more advantage that gives you because, you know, you can kind of be incognito and then be able to pull all of your documentation out and have all of your evidence the next time that you go into court or that this happens. So you kind of want to be an undercover agent. I think people make that mistake a lot where they're sort of telegraphing through their actions and through their messages what things that they're monitoring or looking at or whatever with their ex. 
And so then what a narcissist is going to do is they're going to up their manipulation. They're going to try to find other ways around it, other ways to poke holes, other ways to upset you and try to manipulate the situation. But if they don't even know what your thought process is, they don't even know what you're monitoring or what you're looking at, then it becomes a lot more difficult for them to try to manipulate that situation, right? So this, I have a client that always said, this is like playing, we're going to play chess. We're not going to play checkers. They're playing checkers. We're going to play chess. And so, you know, part of that is like playing things closer to the vest and, you know, kind of being very strategic about it and not just putting everything out there for the world to see, right? And that way you keep them guessing. And I always want them guessing about what I'm doing because that makes it harder for them to manipulate me. That's the whole goal. All right, guys. So I hope this has been helpful. If you would like to learn more about my coaching programs, please go to divorceuniversityonline.com forward slash VIP dash coaching. There's a link on that page. You can book a free strategy session with me. I'd love to talk to you about your case and share about my programs and find out how I might be able to support you on this journey. See you guys next time. We